Okay, so um, yeah, let's let, let's get started. This is um, very pleased to welcome everyone to our rent repayment orders and enforcing housing standards um, webinar. I'm Ed Fitzpatrick. I'm chairing tonight. We got three brilliant speakers. We got um, Tim Baldwin from Chambers, Catherine O'Donnell from Chambers. And we're really really grateful that Al McLenahan from Justice for Tenants um, has agreed to join us all. Um, just in relation to the event, it's live streamed and recorded. The recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, with the link and slide sent to all attendees. Um, and just in relation to questions, um, it's very difficult to um, take questions directly um, from participants. So if you could put questions in the Q&A box and our speakers will aim to answer your questions at the end of the seminar, um, time permitting. Um, and we do aim to finish the seminar at 6.30 fairly promptly. So just in terms of what we're going to cover, Tim's going to kick off and deal with um, the development of rent repayment orders, and in particular, the case of Rackerson, which went to the Supreme Court, and what's happened after that in terms of um, an amendment to the rent reformers, rent reform bill. Um, then Al is very kindly going to speak about dealing with rent repayment orders and enforcement on the ground, how the system works at the minute, weaknesses, and the need for further reform. And then Catherine's going to come in to deal with quite a large topic at the end, um, um, housing conditions update, and she'll be dealing with the Renters Reform Bill, AWAB's law, um, and some interesting stuff to do with um, cases on, on quantum. So to start off, um, and I don't really need to introduce them, um, We've got um, Tim Baldwin speaking. Um, Tim's involved in chambers in um, all aspects of housing, disrepair, housing standards work. He worked with me on the Rackerson case. Um, he's also got a very varied practice um, to do with mental health, mental capacity, discrimination work, and cases in, in the Code of Protection. And he, he he's he's a great person because of the transfer of knowledge between these different disciplines. So as I say, he's going to start off um dealing with the nuts and bolts of rent repayments order, orders, the development and the law, and where we're at now. So I'll hand over to Tim. So what I'm going to talk about is what I'm calling the path to Jefferson and Recuter and, and Rackerson and uh the road to reform afterwards. And it's noteworthy in how um, housing, large-scale housing, has changed over the past uh, 40 to 50 years, where you had a predominantly social sector, and it's moved into uh, pr private uh, sector letting. So the dominant uh, provision has moved from social housing to private housing, and the 1988 Housing Act created uh, a sort of a liberal regime also as compared to how private housing operated before that. And what you see is a liberalization and then a, regula reg uh, a regulation and a continued regulation of the, the private sector. So what uh, we're going to look at are how rent repayment orders have developed and uh, the extension of liability. So first off, we're going to look at how uh, uh, rent repayment orders developed and their importance, how the case of Jefferson in particular came about, and the decision in Jefferson and how this was a stepping stone to uh, reform in the end, and how uh, change to the regime is starting to come about and how it started to come about out of the decision in Jefferson. So rent repayment orders have their origins in the Housing Act 2004. And the Housing Act 2004 introduced a lot of uh, new provisions such as uh, licensing of HMOs, prohibition notices, hazard, hazard awareness notices, and so on and so forth. 
And the rent repayment orders were introduced under Section 73 of the 2004 Act in a limited way, in a limited way. And these were uh, restricted only when an offence resulting uh, in the making of an RRO was in respect of a failure to licence a house of multiple occupation under Section 72 of the 2004 Act. So it was limited uh, to that particular uh, provision. And an RRO could only be made on application where uh, the appropriate person had been convicted of an offence under Section 72 of the 2004 Act, or had been required by a rent repayment order to make an order in respect of universal credit or housing benefit payment by claim by local authority. Uh, and importantly, in, uh, as enacted, in order to be liable for uh, an RRO, a rent repayment order, the person had to be an appropriate person as defined under Section 7310 of the 2004 Act. And that was a person who at the time of the payment was entitled to receive on his own account periodic payments payable in connection with such occupation. Thus, in the original legislation, the wording expressly limited the liability uh, for a rent repayment order to the immediate or direct landlord of the tenant. Uh, however, this explicit limitation was not replicated or revised on uh, the implementation of subsequent legislation, which we'll uh, go on to now. And the subsequent legislation was uh, Chapter 4 of Part 2 of the Housing and Planning Act 2016. Uh, the main bits came into force uh, mainly on the 6th of April 2017 and applies only to England. So this piece of legislation on the development of rent repayment orders is an English piece of legislation. Section 73 of the 2004 Act applies in Wales. And the policy development was uh, based on the principle of the polluter pays. And the specific expansion and application of rent repayment orders was in accordance to, uh, uh, in accordance with the following policy development. And this is part of the development to deal with bad stroke rogue landlords and their agents and to drive them out of the housing market. Clearly what you had uh, was the 1988 Housing Act uh, then you had uh, regulation of the Housing Act through the private sector under the 2004 Act, but that wasn't enough. There were still uh, problems with certain landlords and their agents. And the idea was to try and drive them out of the housing market. And the Communities Local Government Select Committee, as it was then, highlighted in July 2013 a lack of resources that were available to local authorities to carry out their enforcement activities. Because remember, under the 2004 Act, it was for the uh, local authority to enforce uh, 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 these, these orders. And uh, the recommendation was that the burden of payment should be put on the landlord who flout their responsibilities. So uh, it's shifting uh, the enforcement obligation and there was a particular uh, departmental review of housing in the private sector in February 2014. There was a, a consultation called Tackling Rogue Landlords in Proving the Private Rented Sector, a technical discussion paper, and uh, in August 2015. And it, th there was a, a, an approach to have a crackdown on rogue and criminal landlords, including one blacklisting of ro rogue landlords and their agents and extending penalties uh, and ex in extending uh, the, the, the uh, rent repayment orders in terms of uh, penalty, uh, criminal offences that could attach to and in introducing civil penalties. So the underlying principle of all of this was that the polluter pays with cost of enforcement falling on rogue landlords and not good landlords or, or the taxpayer. So that was the push for reform. And... The technical paper said a fine, for example, did not compensate the tenant who'd been a victim of an unlawful eviction. 
uh, and further reference was made to extending uh, rent repayment orders to cover situations where the landlord fails to comply with obligations under the 2004 Act, such as uh, improvement notices, uh, prohibition orders, or hazard awareness notices under the 2004 Act. And uh, the government stated in August 2015, uh, it was arranging for potential measures to uh, crack down on the small minority of criminal landlords who rent out unsafe and overcrowded properties and exploit their tenants. In particular, this was aimed at what you might call the lower value end of uh, the private housing market. Uh, obviously, uh, not at the higher end where you have the Duke of Westminster involved. And the government then pressed ahead and implemented the proposals in the Housing and Planning Bill that was brought to the House of Commons in October 2015. And the policy, underlying policy was to extend enforcement measures uh, against low rogue landlords, which is part of the 2016 Act, the Housing and Planning Act 2016. And it was developed out of practical reasons on the limits of a local authority to fund prosecutions. And in effect, what it did was to create a tenants army operating within a specialist tribunal where the tribunal would make findings in respect of criminality and uh, the uh, making rent repayment orders. So part two in particular of the Act is entitled Road Landlords and Property Agents in England. And it identifies the legislative intentions. Uh, chapter two allows for banning orders to be made where a landlord or property agent has been convicted of a banning order offence. Uh, chapter three, a database of rogue landlords and property agents to be established. And chapter four, a rent repayment order be made because a landlord uh, was an offence of that chapter applies and chapter six contains definition. Uh, and thus, uh, what then happened was uh, the issue that arose in Jefferson. And the reason being that uh, section 40 of the 2016 Act was the core of the dispute in Jefferson. And section 40 it, it introduced key definitions. And it, one of the key definitions is reference to an offence to which this chapter applies. And, and it is, an, is to an offence of a description specified in the table that is committed by the landlord, by a landlord, in relation to housing in England let by that tenant. So there is no definition of a landlord or who a landlord is. Uh, and if one looks at the nature of the offences, such as under the Criminal Law Act 1977, Section 6, violence for securing entry, protection from the Eviction Act, Eviction and harass, Harassment of Occupiers, Housing Act 2004, Section 30, Failure to Comply with Improvement Notice, Failure to Comply with uh, Prohibition Orders under 32.1, uh, Section 72, and Control and Management of Unlicensed HMO, Section 95, Management, Control and Management of an Unlicensed House, uh, and, and within the Act, Section 21, Breach of a Banning Order. So those offences could be convict, committed uh, by a superior landlord as well as an immediate landlord. And there was no definition of that, uh, definition of a landlord within the 2016 Act. So looking expansively at the, le the legislation as, as a whole led to a, a question as whether uh, the Act was now uh, limited to uh, defining a landlord as the immediate landlord under the tenancy or whether ROs could be made against a superior landlord. So there was no express limitation. And uh, there were particular concerns in respect of rent to rent tenancies and whether the statute uh, uh, could include superior landlords uh, up, up the chain of letting because some of those superior landlords would be the ones actually committing the offences that are described under Section 40. And the approach had been the specialist tribunal, and this is always something that actually quite shocked me out of this litigation, was both the first tier and the upper tribunal was to, was to their, their approach was to accept that superior landlords could be liable for rent repayment orders under the 2016 Act in respect of when these specified offences were committed. So in Jefferson, for example, 
18th of December 2019, uh, they found that. Uh, the Upper Tribunal Lands Chambers, Martin Roger, the Deputy President, in a decision of 11th of November 2020, they both held that RROs could be made against superior landlords as well as the immediate landlord. Uh, Mr. Roger may, you know, took a very sort of what you might call um, uh, uh, expensive view of, of the legislation. And, and the uh, 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 first tier tribunal also found that it was bound by another upper tribunal decision in Goldsborough and CA Properties Management 2019. So uh, the upper tribunal uh, dismissed Mr. Rattinson's appeal in respect of uh, the liability issue uh, uh, and uh, uh, given uh, the, the very careful reasons in Deputy President's judgment. And the, the, the judgment was described as careful uh, by the Court of Appeal. So why did the Court of Appeal decide otherwise? Why did they cause all this bother for us? So in the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Andrews held at paragraph 45 that the fact that the offences specified in section 43 of the 2016 Act could be committed by direct landlords tells one nothing as to whether Parliament changed the law to enable RROs to be obtained against the superior landlords. So he, that Lord Justice Andrews went on to state that the answer to the question depends on the construction of 40, uh, section 40, subsection 2, because that section not only defines what an RRO is, but identifies the person against whom such an order can be made. And section 41.1 then goes on to add further, uh, the further requirement the person must have committed one of the offences under 43. And the court identified at paragraphs 46 to 52 of the judgment how the statute was to be interpreted. And when construing section 42 as a whole, with the applicant being a tenant, a tenant or a local authority, the target of the RRO must be the direct landlord. And the court identified uh, uh, paragraph 54 that three matters were particularly uh, reinforcing this conclusion. Namely, that sections 41 uh, 1 and 41 2a together, that it's necessary implicit the housing must be let uh, to the tenant by the landlord committing the offence consistent with the tenancy of housing in section 42. By contrast, the Protection of Eviction Act, that landlord is explicitly defined to include a superior landlord, whereas then it's not, there's no explicit definition in. Uh, uh, the 2016 Act. So in that Act, the one of the uh, uh, Protection from Eviction Act uh, uh, offences, that that does explicitly include a landlord. And uh, the definition presented by the respondent, the learned Mr Fitzpatrick in this case, would mean uh, tenants could obtain RROs, but local authorities could not in respect of uh, uh, enforcing, uh, involving universal credit payments. So it created this disparity between uh, the two um, types of applicant. And at, at paragraph 54, the Court of Appeal um, uh, uh, determined that the Deputy President had erred in departing from the natural construction of 42 in, in terms of looking at the legislation as a whole even though the trend in uh, uh, statutory interpretation was going in that direction, and also that, that the language of the statute was unambiguous. Uh, then uh, the uh, Supreme Court gave permission on this point. Uh, Lord Justice Briggs uh, gave permission in his jolly way, and then Lord Justice Burroughs came along, uh, a person who is an expert on statutory construction and who had to some extent fostered this notion of this more uh, expansive approach to statutory interpretation. Uh, they unanimous, unanimously dismissed the appeal and upheld the Court of Appeals decision and provided a definitive construction of, the, the, of Section 42 of the Housing and Planning Act uh, 
2016. And the approach of the Supreme Court identified that the specialist tribunal, uh, expert tribunal charged with making rent repayment orders had erred in their interpretation of this statute uh, uh, in respect of all of the relevant decisions that have been made. However, in paragraph 43 of the judgment, the Supreme Court identified that if it, if it was the intention of Parliament to capture superior landlords under rent repayment orders, in addition to other sanctions that are under, uh, un, under the statutory scheme, it was for Parliament to legislate on this issue and not rely on what was described slightly unfairly, in my view, a distorted interpretation of the statute. Uh, the, sta the, the interpretation that the, the tribunal uh, went through, particularly Mr. Roger, was uh, in accordance with how statutory interpretation had developed and uh, given a lack of clarity uh, within the 2016 Act. Uh, it, it, it's a little unfair to call it distorted. The Supreme Court, however, did identify that as a result, the, the RRO scheme, as it was, may not be working actually as Parliament intended. And both parties at the time uh, did seek uh, the, uh, the view of the, uh, the, the, the department, but they were rather gnomic about it all and sat on the fence and just said a letter, sent a letter saying, oh, very interested in and what is the outcome as the outcome of this and it would take too long to find out what we really meant by all of this. So just run the case and see what happens. And the Supreme Court said that, that in any event, on any change or reforms, um, the observations that they made at 47 to 40, 44 to 47, the decision identified the practical complexity of ROs operating with um, uh, against superior landlords. And that really needs to be uh, really thought through and considered. So what happened then? So there, it's a tale of an Irishman and a marcher Englishman. Uh, I, I'm a marcher Englishman. I, I live and sit on the border of England and Wales, so I, I, I just don't know what my actual identity is, national identity is, and it's not entering a bar. So it's ensuring that Ed and I took a very sober and reasoned approach to this. So we were instructed by the Department of Lev Leveling Up and Housing and Communities to assist with formulating instructions to the Parliamentary Council on, on government amendments to chapters for the 2016 Act to make uh, to, to enable first tier tribunals to make uh, rent repayment orders against both superior and immediate landlords to make them more effective and to cover situations where any superior landlord, any landlord in, in effect, who committed one of the uh, offences under Section 43 of the 2016 Act were, could be made liable uh, for a rent repayment order. These amendments were introduced in the, it was, it was a very quick piece of work, very intense piece of work. And they were introduced in the, uh, uh, on the 15th of November last year and are provided by way of uh, the Rent reform, reform Bill. And these amendments amend 44 and 45 of the 2016 Act to do a couple of things. One, it, as well as uh, creating liability for uh, uh, any superior landlord, and the wording is any superior landlord, so it can capture a chain of, of illegality, uh, they would have to pay the tenant or local authority from 12 months up to two years rent. So it's increasing the penalty as well as increasing those or expanding those who could be liable. The tribunal would have power to apportion liability under rent repayments orders between the immediate and superior landlord and to be jointly or severally liable to identify who is really uh, culpable for uh, the uh, housing uh, defence. And the amendments can be found at pages 52 of the amendment paper and I've given you the link there. Uh, so far the, the measures have passed and not been amended and Jacob Young uh, the Parliamentary Under Secretary said this new clause, which is intended to be under part three of the bill, will allow such orders to be made by the superior landlords, will extend the period that can be taken into account when calculating payments due under such orders, and will make provision as to how payments are to be calculated and made in cases where there are multiple landlords or multiple orders. 
So it's it's a much more expensive and, uh, and thorough regime. So the conclusions, I'm coming to the end. Uh, uh, so the rent re reform, renters reform bill is making its way through parliament. Uh, these reforms do address uh, the concerns that were expressed and raised to uh, the Supreme Court, and they took that on board. And this does address the issue of statutory construction and the effectiveness of legislation to include liability for superior landlords. And it goes to these issues of rent-to-rent uh, -rent cases and problems uh, that has encountered. These reforms fit into improving conditions in the private sector. Now, there may be further reforms and further developments, and they're designed to look at the rent-to-rent -rent market and low-standard hazardous housing. And they are uh, designed to inform and enable the tenants' army that was described by uh, Simon Mullins by adding to their armory. So we wait on their implementation, uh, that, that they're still to come into force, and how they fit into other reforms improving housing conditions, uh, primarily in the private sector involving these and other social housing sectors. So we'll attempt to answer any questions at the end. So thank you. That's all from me. Now. Um, th thank you very much, Tim. That was a very interesting um, and uh, informative um, talk. Yes, I mean that. Just to echo what Tim said. The, I mean, what what rent repayment orders do is they, and it was referred to when we were arguing the case. It allows empowers tenants to prosecute rogue landlords, and it, in in relation to that, the, it, it, it's worth saying that one of the. Um, main facilitators of tenants' rights is our next speaker, um, Al McLenahan, um, who in fact acted for the tenants in the in the uh, Jepson and others um, throughout. Um, he brought the case before the first tier property tribunal and then the uh, upper tribunal and, and was with us all the way. Um, so Al, Al is the founder of, the, of Justice for Tenants, not-for-profit organisation that aims to improve the standards for renters, educates tenants about their rights so they are empowered and share the knowledge with other tenants and provides extensive training and support services for local authorities to increase the amount of enforcement they take via rent repayment orders and civil financial penalties. And I think that's something that's coming to the fore because I think they're going to have more of a duty to act and as a result, I always knew Al as Al from Justice for Tenants, but he's now got an exceptionally long job title, um, which I think is on his first slide. But what he's going to talk to us about is the situation on the ground, the weaknesses of, of, of the current legislation, how it could be improved and where we're at. And perhaps in particular, some of the issues arising with rent to rent schemes, which featured heavily in all the arguments um, in in the Jepson, the Rackus and Jepson case. So I'll hand you over to Al. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, and thank you also to Ed and Tim for all your wonderful work um, in the recusing case. And yeah, uh, I won't introduce myself again. Um, Ed's done a brilliant job of that. I'll, I'll just give a brief kind of summary of. The experience that I've had and JFT has had, which maybe informs what I'm going to talk about. Starting off with uh, the fact that personally I have done rather a lot of rent repayment order hearings and in the last five years I've been overseeing our uh, training of new advocates at Justice for Tenants. And at JFT we, we do about 35 new sets of proceedings, so new RO applications every month, which I think somewhere probably around two-thirds of, of the total. Um, and that's on behalf of tenant applicants, but also on behalf of, of local authorities as well. Um, but what's quite interesting is that we also find out a lot about how unrepresented tenants do. And unfortunately, that usually takes the form of after an unrepresented tenant has a decision and they don't understand it, they are signposted or referred to us by a law centre or the tribunal case officer um, or a local authority. And I'm going to just start off with just saying, you know, how accessible are rent repayment orders, you know, on the ground? Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is that there is absolutely a massive growing chasm in the likelihood of success for unrepresented tenants. It used to be that 
represented tenants, unrepresented tenants, as long as they were de decently competent lay representatives, both could expect if the breach had occurred to be successful in a rent repayment order. Indeed, that was broadly the case um, in the very early rent repayment orders under the Housing and Planning Act that we were doing in 2017 and 2018. But what we're actually seeing now is, is I would say, if the, the most common breach is um, someone being a person managing or in control of an unlicensed HMO. Applicant tenants, even competent lay representatives, um, if the respondent landlord gets good representation, so maybe not your high street list who's never seen one before, but good representation, a good barrister, I would expect the tenants to be unsuccessful the vast majority of the time. And that wasn't the case before. And I think it's kind of, when you think about it, it's actually probably not that surprising. You have, you know, a civil setting with a civil remedy, but a criminal standard of evidence, a criminal breach that has to be pr proven. And when you think about the experience for a lot of tenants, it will be local authority says, hey, we're taking action against this, this landlord for not having, say, an HMO license. Here's a rent repayment order one form. It's nice and simple. There's not lots of gatekeeping. Go ahead and apply. But obviously, there's lots of elements to prove the breach um, with HMO licensing breaches, which are still massively overrepresented. The vast, vast majority of rent repayment order applications are for breaches of Section 72.1 of the 2004 Act. Um, that you have to prove to the criminal standard all the different limbs of the HMO test in Section 254 you're using. You have to address Section 263. And these are things that don't don't really occur to a tenant, and it's tricky because if they uh, they're empowered to do it, often because the local authority or a local law centre advises them that they can, and they have some email correspondence around it. And if they were told of the full kind of complexity of proving it, they might think, "Well, I can't can't do that." So it's a bit of a catch twenty two. But often I think it comes down to the fact that they don't submit evidence to prove the breach. I don't submit evidence to prove, in particular, the different limbs of the Section 254 definition. And often that's because they don't provide witness statements or their witness statements don't address each of the limbs. I'm sure the vast majority of people here, when looking at doing a rent repayment order, would carefully work through Section 40 to Section 44 as required, cover all the elements, include that in their submission, make sure they've met all the different limbs of the definition they need to do. But that's not what a lay uh, um, applicant would do. And so it's not uncommon to see applicants put forward their evidence bundle. It will include some correspondence from a local authority saying a property is in breach, or it will include a screenshot of their local authority website saying this property needs a license. Um, and it will address the things that are important to them. They didn't protect my deposit. They tried to steal money. They didn't do repairs. There was poor management. The boiler kept breaking down and they never fixed it properly. But they won't focus on the things that you absolutely 100% have to prove to be able to get a rent repayment order. So they'll submit their evidence bundle. The respondent will often have one throwaway line in their evidence bundle saying, we do not accept the breach and we put the applicants to the strictest burden of proof. Applicants do their response. They don't think much of that line. Um, they don't address that line. And then in the hearing, especially if there's no witness statements at all, the barrister for the respondent the respondent landlord will say, where's the evidence in your submission that shows that you're not all part of the same household? And the tenants will be confused and think, well, we're not. We've all got different last names. Quite correctly, the barrister for the landlord will say, your opportunity to submit new evidence has passed. You had an opportunity in your applicant's evidence bundle. We raised our concerns. You had an opportunity to reply to them. This is not an opportunity to submit more evidence. Where, in what evidence you've submitted, have you addressed this? Where have you proven it? The burden is on you. Or often, if not all the occupants throughout all the period are applicants, uh, uh, it won't. The um, main residence argument won't be addressed for all applicants. So you can cover in witness statements. You know, this tenant here, we knew him really well. He stayed there every night. You know, show that you know that person. Show that um, it, there isn't a reasonable doubt that it was their main residence. Um, but if that's not covered, that's an easy avenue to push back on. And they can and are successful the vast majority of the time um, when those grounds exist. And I think it is just not 
having witness testimony, not go being not having the mindset as a tenant, someone who's not got legal experience to go through the different limbs of the definition to think, just because I know the breach has occurred and I know the landlord knows the breach has occurred, doesn't mean that you'll be successful. You have to you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And another part is to do with kind of what, what I might just refer to as picking a respondent. Um, so there was a case that was came through to us, which was unsuccessful, uh, the back half of last week that I looked at, where the applicant tenants had brought action and their tenancy agreement listed their letting agent as the landlord. But the ten tenancy agreement was signed by, I'm not going to use the real name, but a Mr. X. And in fact, there was lots of correspondence where letting agent, Mr. X and tenants were all of the understanding that Mr. X was the landlord. And then when it came to the hearing, Mr. X said, well, I'm not the landlord, or rather said, I put you to the proof that I am the landlord because I don't have an interest in this property because the land registry showed Mrs. X as the sole um, long leaseholder of, of the flat as it was. And, so, and, and without putting forward, and this is the key part, this is all can be done without putting forward any positive case of the landlord, just saying, where's the evidence of this? You haven't proved this. Uh, where's your evidence to the criminal standard that I'm a landlord, that I'm appropriate under section 263? How do you prove that I am the immediate landlord? And furthermore, how do you prove that I received any rent? And obviously, if, if we were bringing the case, we'd see, well, the letting agents named as the landlord, it's Mr. X is acting as a landlord, and we have heard nothing from this Mrs. X. Let's add them all as applicants and then submit a Rule 20 application um, requiring or requesting disclosure of the relevant information that would resolve in a preliminary way who is the immediate landlord. Um, another issue, and this is one, it's a real shame because it used to be the case that for HMO licensing breaches with some guidance, it could work. You could support tenants, they could do it themselves. Now it's really the case that that isn't true. They need representation if the respondent gets their own good representation. But we're now at the point where we can't even say to someone who, you know, um, husband and wife renting a property in a selectively licensed area, we used to say, well, you can bring that application yourself. You know, we can support you if you need, but here's some guidance on how to do it. But um, they're proving to be unsuccessful in large part because of not including a licensing designation. There's plenty of case law where the tribunal judge has said, we see the correspondence from the local authority where they say the property needs a license and doesn't have it. We see the screenshot from the local authority website saying this property needs a selective license. But how can we be sure to the criminal standard as the respondent's representative has raised that this property isn't exempt or rather proactively falls into the remit of the type of property that the selective licensing scheme designates as needing a selective license because you haven't included the designation. And that's something that is such an easy oversight to make because it wouldn't occur to, to uh, tenants without experience that they'd need to do that because everyone in the tribunal hearing room knows, you know, knows that this property would need a selective license. But that is a reason for failure. Um, and it's a reason that will usually cause failure. And the last one is one where um, if the tenants are not represented, the landlord, um, land, landlord will put forward a very strong counterclaim for very large amounts of money. The tenant will usually go back to the law center or the local authority that signposted them to the RR01 application form. And they'll say, we can't help you at this point. Um, we're not able to help you. And then the respondent landlord will increase the pressure four days later, five days later, you know, why have you not responded? We've now to incur these costs. Here's a bit invoice, pay these costs. Otherwise we're gonna apply for costs just generally kind of ratcheting up the pressure. If you think about the kind of tenants who are often in the worst quality kind of HMOs, they have quite a lot of stress factors in their life already. They're unable to get support. Um, and then at a certain point, the respondent landlord will offer to drop hands, withdraw the application, everyone walks away. And it just seems so risky for someone who has no spare funds, can't get any guidance, feels completely outgunned, and then they'll withdraw. And we know that these dead generally don't have much truth to them at all, because if a tenant comes to us at that point and we represent them, um, it's usually the case that a settlement offer at around, you know, 70% or so, 65% will come within in with no mention of these counterclaims ever again, which suggests perhaps they weren't truly valid. Um, 
And a massive precedent came out, I think it was probably a couple of years ago, it might have been three, uh, Achenpong versus Roman. It imposes a systematic framework for determining quantum in rent repayment orders. And in fact, the upper tribunal has imposed the same process seven or eight months ago in civil financial penalties. Um, in a really reductive way, your offences have levels of seriousness. The most serious starts off with the highest awards. Um, it has meant that that framework means that there's less hearings and more settlements, uh, in large part because whilst there was a wide remit of what you could expect from awards, now if it's an HMO licensing breach um, and we're providing representation, generally speaking, the award's going to be between, you know, maybe 55 and 80 percent of the rent. Um, so even if JFT's perspective that we provide to our clients is we think on average you'll get 75 percent here, and the landlord's representative said, we think you'll have 55% awarded. That difference between them is less than the cost of representation for the landlord respondent. And so it's entirely financially viable to find a big middle ground, um, just because of, from a financial decision, the landlord will be smart to settle at that point. But we are seeing lower rewards. If the most serious offence is someone who's used violence to secure entry and then unlawfully evicted a tenant from an unlicensed HMO, if that's what's needed to get 100% of the rent awarded, well, relative to that, everything else is less, less serious. On the face of it, an HMO licensing breach is less serious than that. So um, that's led to lower rewards, but I think that might be part of the reason why DLUC um, thought that increasing the amount of uh, rent that you could apply for was appropriate because it's not achieving the deterrent purpose. If a landlord can say, well, it's still a good business model to operate criminally, you know, breach the laws, cram loads of tenants into substandard unlicensed HMOs and take into account enforcement through rent repayment orders and other means at the cost of doing business, which just lowers the profits, but makes it still viable. Um, we're also seeing now, because you have to show seriousness and um, because there's kind of a framework, there's a lot greater emphasis, at least on, on our side, on legal breaches that are commissioned, that are linked to the commission of the offence. So going back to the most common example, unlicensed HMO, landlord uh, doesn't license the HMO and maybe they are haven't got electrical safety certificates, haven't provided EPCs to the tenants, they breach of the Home Fitness for Human Habitation Act, there's management regulation breaches, electrical regulation breaches, say. Um, a landlord in a, in a catch-22 on cross-examination where you can say if you had applied for a license you would have had to comply with all of these legislative requirements would you in fact have not committed all of these breaches of law and regulations if you had applied for a license or would you have continued still breached those elements of law and the landlord correctly will say no no i assure you if i'd have known about it if i'd applied for a license i would have amended everything there wouldn't have been any breaches of law and then you're able to argue in submissions well look at the significant health and harm risks lack of protections that the applicant tenants received as a direct cascading consequence of this offense therefore this offense is perhaps a bit more serious because without it all of these other offenses that increase the risk of death harm um, lack of protection for the occupants uh, they only they would not have experienced it but for this breach of law. And certainly cross-examination is really becoming a much more important skill. Um, the devil is becoming much more in the details. It, it's, it's, in 2018, your average cross-examination of a respondent was 15, 20 minutes. Now it's probably about an hour and a half, at least the way, the way we do it, because you kind of have to tease out the arguments, the inconsistencies, and draw the attention to it, because that's going to be a big determining factor in quantum. Um, we're also noticing just that the tribunals are, 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 are tending, tending lots of big differences between judges, tending to rely a bit more on kind of here are factual things we can use to determine um, how much to award, like legal breaches, or has the local authority carried out enforcement. Um, there tends to be an understanding that if the local authority has carried out enforcement, they must have thought it was a bit more serious than if they haven't. Um, that is completely wrong. How much local authority enforcement occurs is almost exclusively down to what local authority is it? That's the main determining factor. But nevertheless, that is something that we're seeing being taken into account in a much more significant way. 
by the tribunals. And following on from what Tim said, um, the Jepson legacy has been absolutely tragic, absolutely tragic in achieving the exact aims that the rent, uh, rent repayment orders were meant to have under the Housing and Planning Act. Most tenants entitled to a rent repayment order who contact us have RO claims that are valid but pointless. We have no doubt that we will be able to prove that an offence occurred. We have no doubt that we would be able to get a piece of paper for the applicant tenants entitling them to an amount of rent. And we also have no doubt that that amount won't be paid. And as a nonprofit, we can't afford to spend the resources when it's not going to achieve anything. It won't deter the criminality. It's going to waste our time, the applicant's time, the tribunal's time. It won't waste the rent to rent company's time. It won't waste the superior landlord's time. And it won't achieve anything because it's largely around a business model that exists to not have assets, pull out money from exploiting poor tenants uh, and not pay any debts, instead to close down and start a new company if any winding up petition occurs. And it's the, 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 the tragic part of it is the very, very worst condition properties are the properties which now you can't expect to uh, be successful in anything other than paper terms. These are the ones, you know, your two or three bedroom flat where they've thrown up some partition walls, chucked in some bunk beds. It's a complete death trap. It's damp, there's mold, the conditions are horrendous, it's high risk of death. And there's nothing to prevent this business model at all, as currently stands. You have a maybe a property owner, 10 properties built on this criminal business model, making 10 times more per property than a legitimate angle. They've got a rent to rent company, maybe their own one, maybe in a friend's name, maybe an actual third party rent to rent company. Tenants take action. Um, they get, get it against uh, the rent repayment order goes against the rent to rent company. The rent to rent company just switches companies, same properties, same landlords, same tenants, no change in the business model. Superior landlord, property owner still gets all their rent. It does, there's nothing that can deter it because rent to rent, most of it, is designed to criminally operate outside the law. And I know trading standards are looking how to regulate rent to rent, but there has to be a shared understanding that there's very little space for legitimate operators to enter because the criminal business model is completely embedded and is so very profitable. And the amendments, particularly the superior landlord ones, they should make a massive difference because you can't really do much about the actual rent to rent companies because the people running them have no realistic alternative, right? Um, they don't have earning power or earning potential elsewhere. But the property owners do, they have a choice. And I do worry that with the rent of the reform bill amendments, it may move on to kind of arguments around section 263 to kind of just get out of liability of the superior landlord. There was a, a case precedent recently called uh, Cotton and Others versus Low Property Management. And you can just sort of see this will be the kind of battleground and argument ground over the upcoming years. Section 263 achieves many purposes for many different bits of legislation. And as a result, it's not really fit for purpose often for all the specific bits. It, it's, it's come from a very old history. And I do hope that there will be reform of, ha of the Section 263 requirement, at least as it pertains to your licensing offences, your Section 72 one and your Section 95 one offences. Um, I personally don't like the idea of apportionment in the Renters Reform Bill. You've got your property owner and your rent to rent company and the tribunal can say, all right, well, there's £10,000, let's apportion it out percentage. They can do it jointly and severally, but let's go back to the criminal business model, which I think is a good place to start. You don't want a system that actually works against everything other than the most hardened criminal business models. Well, you bring a rent, rent repayment order there. Uh, the property owner has a contract with that rent to rent company, which says the property won't be used as an HMO, will inform you if it ever is an HMO. Property owner can say, look at this, I have no idea. And if it's really well developed, the rent to rent company will write into the tribunal and say, yeah, no, we, we lied to the landlord, he had no idea. Um, and we take full responsibility. You tell me how a tribunal with those facts being presented, no way to disprove them, is going to apportion out the rent. Um, and it's functionally will maybe be 5% of the rent is your cost of doing business as a property owner, and the rest of it is a portion to a rent to rent company that's never going to pay it. Um, I think the solution here, or my hope, is that 
um, DLUC will give guidance that hopefully advises the tribunal to make it joint and severally liable to the rent to rent company and the superior landlord if there is evidence that the rent to rent company won't pay. Shift the burden of trying to extract blood from a stone from basically the poorest tenants in our society who don't have the means to the property owner who chose to put the rent to rent company in charge, let them chase them for money. Let them actually pay the cost of it. Let's see if they will still work hand in glove with these rent to rent companies when there's maybe 15 month rent that need to be given. Um, and I think also hopefully government guidance will help with local authority rent repayment orders because I think the guidance as it currently stands doesn't mesh well with the, the Achimpong framework that's now in place. It makes it very difficult for local authorities to take action. Um, and the last thing I'll speak about is the trends that we're seeing uh, and that we suspect will continue into the future. So there'll be a hell of a lot more rent repayment orders as a result of um, Ed and Tim's work with regards to the Jepson case and adding superior landlords back in. Probably something like, at least from our perspective, will be more than doubling the amount of applications. We're seeing there's less consensus on facts from a, um, a landlord perspective now. That you don't get any benefit by saying, I hold up my hands. Yes, it wasn't, say, licensed. Yes, this or that happened. I accept the breach, subject to any reasonable excuse argument, maybe. Um, that it's not seen as poor conduct to not admit guilt. Uh, so there's no reason to. Why not argue, put someone to the test on every element? It used to be the start of hearings, you kind of have a, a brief discussion in the tribunal room, which are the facts that are agreed, and most would be agreed. And it would come down to, does this reasonable excuse apply? And let's argue about conduct. Not the case anymore. And that factors into the hearings are a lot longer. Probably about 80% of the hearings I did back in 2018 fit into the three hour time limit. Now it's like 5% do, and they're basically the ones where the landlord doesn't get representation or doesn't attend. Um, so the hearings are a little bit longer. The evidence submissions are a little bit more fulsome. We're seeing much greater tenant awareness of rent repayment orders. That's in large part due to the great work from local authorities, law centers, London's Rent of the Union, Generation Rent, ACORN, um, word of mouth as well. But I think also one thing to consider is there's changing demographics. The, the tenants who are most likely to know about their rights and believe they can exercise them usually have higher levels of education, maybe have English as a first language, they're less likely to be migrants. And seven, eight years ago, many of the people who at 30 years old might be buying their first place or renting with their partner are now renting rooms in house share in poor condition properties, and they're not accepting of it. So I think it's also part of the greater amount of awareness is that the type of people who are likely to be aware are living in conditions that they probably wouldn't have been seven years ago, which give rise to grounds for a rent repayment order. It is going to continue to be the case that if a local authority is prosecuted or brought a civil financial penalty, that, that is held in regard by the tribunal. And I think what we're going to see is that um, parties are going to be more represented. Um, tenants we're going to need more representation. It's going to make more sense to have representation for the same reason that it will for landlords. If you're applying for 24 month rent in a zone three, five bed HMO in London, you're probably looking about 110,000 pounds being applied for. It makes sense for everyone to have representation at that point. And the arguments, the precedents are too numerous now for anyone to really wrap their head around it unless they're a specialist. So I think we're going to see it really move away from the idea tenants can bring action unrepresented landlords can defend themselves and the tribunal the right forum for that to it it's you, you're really going to need representation on both sides um and the last thing i'll just mention if you think that you know you, you want any any anyone here wants any kind of training or support with rent repayment orders or if you're from a local authority and you want to be able to signpost tenants or you want jft to recover the universal credit or housing benefit to fund your pr prs enforcement uh, functions, um, or if you're a law centre you know, or a third sector organisation that's looking to signpost or refer, there is my email address. I'm funded by the charity Impact on Urban Health to help with this kind of, of, of stuff. And I think I'll leave it there, Ed. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that, 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 was, that was really interesting and instructive to get the view from the coalface. And um, yeah, 
I mean, some aspects of it are very bleak. I mean, we we always come back to the same discussion we have, those of us who bring cases against rogue landlords for unlawful eviction in the county court. We get all these great damages awards, um, and then the company just goes into liquidation. They set up somewhere else. And these sometimes are not even small companies. They have um, um, landlord organisations that, you know, have got you know, um, a large property portfolio and they just collapse it and move on to the next vehicle. Um, it's it's worth reading in the chat comment observations from Ben from Safer Renting, which echoes um, what Al's saying about um, the current situation and the difficulties um, with enforcement. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, ho hopefully the amendments will assist, but I do agree um, that there will need to be guidance or else they'll just try. They'll just find another way to get out of it. So, the um, the final speaker tonight um is um and it, it, we're going to shift um to housing um conditions and update is Catherine O'Donnell. I don't really need to introduce her. Um, she's got an extensive practice. Um, all the courts, tribunals, court of appeal, dealing with um the full ambit of housing cases, antisocial behaviour and lawful eviction, a lot of Equality Act cases. But she also specialises in um, housing disrepair, one of the main authors of the Housing Conditions, Tenants' Rights lag book, which is my little Bible for all disrepair cases. And she does the lag update, I think it's February every year, which again is really helpful with um, reports on um, disrepair, housing conditions and updates and has very helpful um, quantum cases included in that. So without further ado, I'll let um, Catherine take up the reins. This is going to have to be very quick um, because of the time constraints. So, um, but the the sides are very full. So this is housing conditions update essentially it's based on the recent housing conditions update, which is in the February edition uh, of LAG. There's so much in there, it gets bigger and bigger every year. And I think that's a kind of related to the, the movement there's been in relation to housing condition legislation and policy. But it does mean that I can't fit it all in. So what I've done is, um, I've taken a selection, I'm dealing with some of the new and proposed legislation some of the policy developments and some quantum cases in relation to freedom from habitation. But the, the whole scope of everything uh, is in the housing conditions update. What I'm going to try get to do is to send you a PDF version of, of what's in the magazine so um, you can see um, everything. Um, but what I've done is I've expanded some. Given the time constraints, it probably wasn't a good idea. But I have expanded on things that are in which are useful to understand things that are coming which are in the um, update so if we start uh, with the next slide Anisha, um, and look at which is just a snapshot of poor housing conditions as they stand at the moment now it's worth saying that um, I think in a time that we're in which due to recent terrible events that have happened over the past few years in relation to housing um, we're at a point where public awareness and media coverage of poor housing conditions is as high as I've I've known it personally. And also as, as a result of this institutional activity um, has followed. So there's been more institutional activity and you may have recognized this in courts as well in, in how, in how judges are responding to, to cases that we bring in the county court. They're much more aware of the prevalence and the impact of poor housing conditions. Um, uh, but here on this page is a, a reminder kind of where we are. There are lots of different statistics out there, depending on who you look at. It's sometimes quite confusing, but this is the English Housing Survey. So at the moment, the latest figures show that in 2022, 3.7 million dwellings failed to meet the decent home standard. And private rented dwellings having the highest proportion of non-decent homes at 21%. So you're looking at one in five. Um, eight percent or two point one million dwellings in England have an HHSRS, a Housing Health and Safety Rating System, 
Uh, category one hazard in them, the most serious risk to health and safety. Uh, they were more prevalent in private rented dwellings, 12%, uh, kind of like one in eight. Um, and 4% of 1 million dwellings had a problem with damp, up from 3% in 2019. Damp problems were more prevalent in private rented dwellings with 9% reported to have a problem in 2022 compared to 5% uh, of social renters. Um, and importantly, there's been an increase um, uh, in um, the survey report of damp. That's not complainants going to the ombudsman, for example, but in the surveyed um, uh, population, there was an increase of 7% uh, private rental dwellings with damp to 9% in 2022. So you could just have the next slide, please, Anisha. So obviously the, 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 the driver and the focus on and the public consciousness on damp has been as a result of the tragic case of Arab Ishak. As you may obviously remember, um, at the conclusion of his death, which was as a result of severe, a conclusion of the inquest into his death, which is a result of severe respiratory condition due to prolonged exposure to mould in his home environment, the coroner found it a duty to report a number of matters of concern um, to the government. And the response from the government was to that, to that uh, report came on the 13th of January, 23 when the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing Communities and the Secretary of the State for Health and Social Care responded by saying what actions they were taking. So this has kind of led the agenda really in what's been happening um, in government, which has been very much fueled by, um, by the things that were ha have happened over the past few years and the public's concern uh, and the need to be seen to be doing something about it because something does need to be done about it. And the main things it set out was an amendment to the Social Housing Regulation Bill, as it was at that time, in relation to hazards in social homes. That's what's come to be known as AWAB's law. A review of the health, housing health and safety rating system to include updated estimates on the likelihood of harm due to damp and mould based on current research. Rapid review of existing guidance on the health impacts of damp and mould in homes, followed by new and consolidated guidance tailored to the housing sector. An ongoing review of dec the decent home standards, which has already had already started, and a new private sector uh, landlord ombudsman being created in the Renters Reform Bill. So I'm going to go through all of these, apart from the uh, and what's happened, apart from the decent home standards, which is still continuing. So Anusha, can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is our law, and this is the one that is going to most impact on us as, as lawyers uh, straight away. Um, so the Social Housing Regulation Act received royal assent on the 20th of July uh, last year, but most of its provisions will come into force through regulation, so they're not in force yet. The relevant section for our law is section 42. Section 42 amends the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 by inserting two new sections, 10A and 10B. Section 10A1 implies in a new term into social housing tenancies relating to the remedying of hazards to which section 9A, fitness for human habitation provisions apply. It's very much, it's not really general disrepair, it's very much about fitness or within the remit um, of fitness for human habitation. Um, Labour has said, um, as Angela Rayner had said that it would extend to the pub, private rented sector, but at the moment, for this government, it's only applies to social housing tenancies. And what it does is imply a covenant by the landlord that the landlord will comply with all prescribed requirements. OK, and the prescribed requirements are requirements which are prescribed by 10A subsection 3 that are and then applicable to the lease. Um, what Section 10A3 does is require the Secretary of State to make regulations that will require social landlords to take action in relation to prescribed hazards, which affect or may affect a relevant property within time period or periods to be specified within the regulations. So the meat of all this is in regulations. And it will form the covenant which is implied, just like the other uh, co implied covenants will be part of a tenant's tenancy agreement, forcible through the court as a breach of covenant. So very much on the ground we're familiar with. However, differently to the other sections, it's a defense to the landlord that they used all reasonable endeavors 
to avoid the breach. Okay. Um, and I'll come on to the consultation and that give you an idea of reasonable what the reasonable endeavours might be. So you can have the next slide, Anusha, please. So section 10B and its subsections make the supplementary provisions. Um, they say it may apply to existing leases, existing hazards, and only some description of prescribed hazards and they specify periods in relation to actions, including those not for specific duration, i.e. a reasonable or required period. It can take can require landlords to take action and to take actions which are not intended to remedy the hazards themselves, such as investigations or rehousing, and can require landlords to take action or to not take action in relation to hazards or only in particular circumstances or if particular conditions are met. So it's very wide, giving itself a very wide range of uh, the scope um, for what can be, um, how, how it can compel um, landlords to act. And there is some provision to disapply Section 10A in relation to particular descriptions of leases. It may be uh, that it's it's going to um, limit the, the um, provisions in some way, but it can also uh, make provisions to that correspond to sections nine a four to eight. Those are the sections that deal with anti avoidance, contracting out, specific performance, common parts, and rights of access. The next slide, please. Um, now the meat. A lot of how. This, what it's going to look like on the ground is contained in the recently published open consultation on timescales for repairs, the circumstances under which there should be a temporary decant and the requirement for landlords to maintain adequate records. So the consultation runs for eight weeks. Um, it proposes the law would take into account all the currently 29 hazards, although we'll come on to the fact that that the health and housing health and safety rating system review is going to I said it's going to reduce the hazards to 21. And ha the hazards must pose a significant risk to the health or safety of the actual resident of the dwelling. So that's quite important because you can take into account not just general issues, uh, but actually how it's affecting the present residents. Um, and proposes in summary, once made aware of the hazard, the landlord must investigate within 14 calendar days. Um, they must produce a written summary of the investigation's findings to the resident within 14 days. That includes details of any identified hazard and applicable next steps, including an anticipated timeline for repair and schedule of work. The kind of things that we would always love landlords to provide and they never do, even when you have an order against them. Um, if the investigation indicates a reported hazard that poses significant risk, the registered provider must begin repair works within seven days of the written summary being issued. Next slide, please. Um, they can complete the repair work within a reasonable period of time, and the resident should be informed of that time period and their needs should be considered. The registered provider must action emergency repairs. So the repairs of emergency on, on an emergency basis as soon as practical in any event within 24 hours. If they find a hazard that poses a significant or a significant and imminent risk of harm or danger, um, the property cannot be made safe within the specified timescales the landlord must offer to arrange the occupants to stay in suitable alternative accommodation until it's safe to return. And also they have to keep clear records of all attempts to comply with the proposals, including full records of correspondence. Um, and if the landlord makes all reasonable attempts to comply with the term scales, but is unable for reasons genuinely beyond their control, they will be expected to provide a record of the reasons that prevented them from doing so. So it's very, these are the all proposals by the a consultation paper, very strong on, on record keeping and, and very clear about what the landlord is expected to do. The next slide, please. Within that, the headings of those consultation uh, proposals, there are some sub issues which arise, um, which are also extremely important. The investigator must have the right skill and experience to determine hazards. The landlord doesn't have to do a physical inspection, but should do so if requested. Key to the issue of significant risk, resident vulnerabilities must be taken into account when considering the effect of the hazard. 
for the hazard, although medical evidence is not necessary. They can't require you to provide medical evidence of this. As we know, it's so difficult uh, to get, uh, particularly um, when, when you're looking for things to be done quickly, to get medical evidence and support, even a letter from the doctor can take weeks and weeks. There's a written summary is provided within 48 hours of the investigation concluding. There's a minimum requirement for what's in the written summary, um, which is set out um, in the consultation, which is required even if no hazard is found. Starting works can include temporary works as part of a paced process. And it may be the case, as often with some of our clients or sometimes happens, that regardless of the state of the premises, they really don't want to move and there might be many reasons for that. Um, landlords must provide information to them on how to keep themselves and their families safe until the hazard is addressed and what to do in an emergency. Uh, in relation to access, and then this will feed into what's reasonable um, action, the landlord must take three attempts to contact the resident to arrange access at a suitable time, taking account of the resident's needs. And again, with an eye on the defence, um, if there's a shortage of labour or materials, the landlord must update the resident on delays and rec record attempts to source work workers and or materials. So it's going to have to be a big culture shift for landlords in that they're going to have to evidence everything that they do. And that's uh, uh, maybe certainly may be required in the regulations. Um, so. Uh, Obviously, they have to investigate all uh, potential hazards. That's important when it's reported, they have to investigate it. They then decide whether it's a significant hazard or not. Whether it's a significant risk um, doesn't mean it has to be a category one risk, it will depend on uh, the um, particular resident and their vulnerabilities, that's important. Hazards which warrant emergency repairs are those that represent significant and imminent risk of harm. Um, if there is no significant risk, but the hazard or defect, but there is a hazard or defect, then the landlord will still be expected to provide a written summary. So that's also important and that will overlap with their other uh, repairing duties um, and set out the next steps on the remedial work. So this is quite a, a big, you know, um, uh, a very important uh, piece of legislation um, that's going to have hopefully quite significant impacts. There's going to be a lot of disputes arising that we can see, for example, disputes as what is to a significant or a significant and imminent risk. Um, a disputes as to what is a reasonable, action reasonable time period and disputes, you know, was work is sufficient. But um, it's going to put an awful lot more pressure on local authorities. They might have to hire more staff. They certainly have to go and get a recording system, which is up to the job. And they're certainly going to have to train staff into the need to, to make these records and to keep them and to disclose them. So that's really important. Um, I'm very much aware of the time. And there's, I've, I've got a lot to go through. I've, I've, I concentrated on ARBSOR because I know it's very um it's a very important piece of legislation that is going to come relatively soon. Um, but so going much more quickly, I'll just point out, can I use the next uh, slide, please? Um, the, H the Housing Health and Safety Rating System Review, um, uh, I've referenced there, there's a, a policy paper uh, entitled Summer Report, Outcomes and Next Steps Review the Housing Health and Safety Rating System. Um, which has remodeled it. The idea is to make it easier. Uh, there's no mention, going back to what uh, the response to the coroner's report, there's no mention in the summary of updating the estimates on the likelihood of harm due to damp and mold. However, the guidance on damp and mold, which I'm going to continue, seems to have done quite a re an extensive review of the evidence. And I'm um, surprised if this hasn't fed into the health, health the review. However, there's been some really critical voices of the review. Um, the proposed revisions to, the, uh, to the, the system have been subject to criticism that will in fact severely reduce its effectiveness. And you should look at two articles in Legal Action, which I've referenced there to see why they say that's the case. Uh, the next slide, please, is relating to the guidance on damp and mold in the housing sector. 
Now, I've only mentioned it the briefest of summaries here. Um, it's a very, I think, important document for us as advisors and trying uh, and people who are trying to um, hold landlords to account on their actions in relation to damp and mould. Uh, it covers the health the health effects of damp and mould, who will be at an increased risk, the legal standards in rented homes, and identifying and addressing damp and mould, and provides guidance and resources for tenants. Importantly, it underlines the health risk of damp and mould, both mental and physical. And I think the mental effects, even to those people who do not suffer from respiratory illnesses, can be overlooked. Um, importantly, it sets up a new culture um, that tenants should not be blamed for damp and mould. And it's not the result of lifestyle choices, which was very much running through the way the landlord tra treated the family of our Ishak. And it's the responsibility of the landlord to identify and address the causes of the problem. Uh, I say it's a key, uh, would say it's a key document in your damp and mould cases going forward. Um, it sets out how the landlord should be responding identifying and addressing the damp and mould and monitoring it. So it's a really um, has a lot of useful information on what the government says the, the landlord should be doing. Um, very briefly, on moving on to the um, Renters Reform Bill, there are a couple of two or three things in there which will have implications for housing conditions. Uh, there is the Landlord Redress Scheme, the Ombudsman Scheme, um, which... Uh, uh, all private landlords will be uh, required to join. Just moving through this very quickly, the housing conditions link is that the government has said that um, the this could include um, the complaints um, um, that are made by tenants to the ombudsman could include complaints about the standard of the property or where repairs have not been completed within a reasonable time frame something you know, akin to the housing ombudsman, perhaps uh, the kind of thing, work they do now. And the scheme administrator can acquire an apology, an explanation or compensation from the landlord and to take other such actions or the interests of the complainant. The guidance suggests compensation could be up to £25,000, which sounds like a lot, but when I come onto the fitness cases later on, it's going to start looking pretty small. The next page, um, uh, give some more um, uh, information on the um, penalties that can be imposed by the local housing authority. And, and going back to, to what um, uh, Tim uh, and I were talking about, um, about superior landlords, in this case, the Secretary of State has the power by regulation to change the meaning of landlord to include any superior landlord in relation to the tenancy. Next slide, please. The... Um, the database is what was known as the property portal. The database sits behind essentially the property portal and um, it will contain entries in respect of all current or intended landlords and dwellings. And the regulations may require information to be provided and documents. And the government response to the select committee report and the bill said the required compliance information could include gas and electrical safety certificates and they're considering requiring landlords to certify they meet the detailed home standards, which is important because it will be an offence to falsely or recklessly uh, give uh, incorrect information. They're required to, to have an active uh, landlord and dwelling entry, otherwise they can't market the property. There can be financial penalties imposed by the local housing authority, uh, and it will be offence to know any or recklessly provide false or misleading information. And conviction can be the basis of a rent repayment order. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, and then the bill in late in the day in November were introduced um, amendments to apply the decent home standard to the private rented sector. Um, I've just set out there what the decent home standard is, which I won't go through with you. But if we move to the next slide. Um, what essentially what the bill will do was amend the Housing Act 2004 uh, by regulation to specify requirements that must be met by qualifying residential premises. Um, and I've set out there what those residential premises are. And on the next slide, 
the matters that would be covered by the requirements include the state of repair of the premises, things provided for safety, security or comfort, and means of keeping the premises suitable temperature. Requirements will be type one or type two. Type one are have a duty to be enforced under section five of the Housing Act 2004 and type two of the power to be enforced. Uh, and just essentially, it essentially melds into the existing system for um, category one hazards and it adds to those to, uh, to deal with requirements. Um, and so the, uh, the local authority can serve awareness notice, improvement notice, prohibition orders, and take emergency action. Their financial penalties and rent repayment orders can be sought when an offence has been committed. The next slide, please. Um, local authority enforcement. All I'm going to say about this is everybody knows about the difficulty of the local authority of enforcement. So everything that has has gone before is subject in the bill to local authority enforcement. Um, and I just mentioned some of the most recent evidence about the difficulties and or lack of enforcement. It was um, uh, an observer analysis uh, in January, uh, which of uh, data from the Department for Leveling Up Housing, uh, which found local authorities were inspecting just about half of all reports of damp and mould they received in the private rented sector. So that's what they're doing in relation to current hazards. So um, it's it's clear that they, um, that more resources are going to be needed if this these new provisions are going to be enforced. Um, next slide, please. Um, but one of the difficulties in addition to um, uh, more resources is 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 also um it's just recruitment is it not only are there not enough um, in, in posts it's very difficult for for, for, for local authorities to re recruit so something really needs to be done about that um next slide please i'm very okay so i'm going to come now to the end to look at two cases on quantum now you wait for years is it four years since the um, renters uh, sorry the um the fitness for human habitation provisions came into a force and we've been waiting to find out about what effect uh, there is on quantum, what's the relationship with quantum. And we have two cases. Um, and I'll just talk about the main points briefly. The first case, in this case, the disrepair fell into three periods, but from the third period, it also was unfitness. So from 20th of March 2020 to 7th of November 23, the disrepair was also found to be uh, a lack of fitness for human habitation. If you go to the next slide, please. And what the judge in that case found was that the first and second periods were, really, were given 35% and 40% of rent in compensation. But the third period, which is the period where it was out of, lacked um, fitness for human habitation, the DJ considered the appropriate level of damages to be 100% of the rent. And the interesting thing about this case is that it was, she decided the reason why it was 100% seems to be not because in her discretion she gave 100%, but that essentially she had to give 100% because it was a binary decision. Either a property was fit for human habitation or it was not. And where it was not, the tenancy cannot be said to have received any benefit for the tenancy for that period. All in all, the tenant received over £53,000 in compensation. The important thing to remember, I think, about this case is that it's, it's certainly an interesting case, but and it's a great result for the tenant. But, and it's certainly one you might want to refer to in negotiations, but you have to, I think, be realistic about this. This was an undefended case, an undefended case. In a defended case, particularly a local authority or a social housing provider, you may expect an appeal on that point. It's a novel point um, and, you know, um, it's, a, it's a very um, contentious one. Um, I was told in a case when I referred to this case uh, by, recently by a judge that they thought it was a very bold decision and they weren't interested in following it. Not, um, at the, uh, And I think if you are going to rely on it, you have to be aware of the fact that it, there may be an appeal. And as uh, you might have a strategy 
uh, for dealing with that, because of course, if it's just a damages appeal, then you won't be covered by legal aid. So, you know, I'm not saying don't try it, but I'm saying have a strategy with it and look at who your uh, your opponent is. And then finally, um, the second case um, in relation to this, um, Mason uh, versus Oliveira and Santana, slightly different in the case that it, it seems there was a lot more serious disrepair. It was a, a one bedroom flat on the Aylesbury estate and they found very poor conditions uh, since the beginning of the tenancy. The experts decided that the property is both unfit for home inhabitation and uninhabitable. And you can see that there were some quite bad conditions there, including no central heating and in a one bedroom flat, an unusable bedroom and a bathroom, unusable bathroom, then leaks and drain problems. Next slide, please. And what the, was decided there by our erstwhile colleague, District Judge Naidu, um, oh, sorry, also there'd been an uh, emergency prohibition order. So these things are really stacking up in terms of the terrible state of things. So or, on ordinary principles, up to the date that the fitness um, provisions came into force, she gave 75% of the rent. And then from the 20th of March, 2020, 100% of the rent on the basis the property was not fit for habitation, okay? But we also know it was uninhabitable. But she also went further than that and awarded 150% of the rent uh, during the period after which it was um, the emergency prohibition order and she'd had to be moved, the tenant, because of the additional inconvenience. And I believe that uh, the um, she also referred reminded herself of the case of English churches and shine. And I'll just finish with this, that while it's great to get 100%, you want your 100% to stick as much as you can. And do not forget that while we've been used to thinking, okay, what are the previous cases in this particular uh, variety of, of poor housing conditions, be it heating, be it, you know, damp or whatever. And we've gone, we thought, oh, there's 40%, that's 60%. Don't forget that um, the case law um, gives a wide discretion to the court, allows 100% anyway in very bad conditions, but allows more than 100%. And in a case I did recently, the judge, while deciding that it didn't agree with De Zitter and it was a bold decision to make. It did agree that um, that compensation for housing uh, fitness cases should be more than for disrepair cases. It was of a different order. And he agreed that he had the power to award up to 100% and more. Okay, so it's already there. And I think we, we will be pushing, as I said right at the beginning, judges are more aware uh, they're ordinary members of the public like everybody else and they are very much aware of the of the issues uh, and the impact of poor housing conditions and so I would uh, rely on Desitter if that's what you want to do refer to Desitter if you would also prefer to do that but at the same time recognize that there are there are um, there is the power there and courts do like retaining a discretion um uh, and they can now be more easily, I think, convinced to use it to give higher rates of compensation. Thank you. Sorry, I think we've gone past half past six and that's been a very, very swift. But uh, thank you. Um, we, we are at, at past half six, but I don't know whether we could take just um, a couple of questions. Um, and um, we leave you for the moment, Catherine. There's a couple of interesting points raised in relation to your talk. I mean, I agree entirely with De Sitto. I think that was a very, very qualified endorsement of it, the approach. Um, but yes, really helpful. So just just to um, deal with a couple of questions, we haven't got very much time. Um, Mashuk has asked the question, what remedy is available to a tenant if a landlord came to the property threatening to the tenant to vacate the property following non-payment of rent caused by disrepair? I mean, I, I, I won't go to one of the speakers um, I'll just say that it's if you look at Section 40 of the Housing and Planning Act, it sets out the offences for which a landlord can be liable um, and, and, and the platform for the making of a rent repayment order. So if there's an eviction or harassment, 
um, that can be sufficient. If there's a level of harassment and you can prove that beyond reasonable doubt, then you may have a basis for a claim. But then there's a question for Tim. It said by Vincent says, Tim mentioned the renters reform bill was still going through Parliament, but um, I think a bit of the question's missing. But in terms of the timetable for that, um, can you say anything about that, Tim? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, uh, I don't think the next stage has been set yet. I, I haven't looked at it. Um, it's likely that the renters' reform bill will pass into the next parliamentary session uh, after the election. And as I understand it, at least with the present colour of the Conservative government and uh, the present colour of the Labour government, it will continue. If the Conservative government, and I say if, um, did uh, come back into power, but with a more of a, a landlord focus, then th there may be a risk to it. But I, I don't think it's going to be I don't think it's going to get royal assent until um, probably 2025. I, I just have a feeling there is so much involved in it uh, that that it's hard to 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 know when it's actually going to come. Uh, when you get royal assent, and also when you get uh, commencement orders on the re relevant bits, it's a very large piece of legislation that still only through amendment and reform. Um, but I, yep. I don't have oh, any time we, to... We've got an election. Um, so then a quick one for Al. Who will enforce a rent repayment order made by the first tier tribunal? Yeah, so the process is that you um, have to apply to turn it into a county court judgment, which is, cost, well, depending on which court you go to, it costs like 40 odd quid or it costs nothing. And it's just an, kind of an automatic process. So that doesn't mean it's a quick process with the current court system. And then it's like any other county court judgment. Um, we basically take the approach that if it's got to that point, um, we do interim charging order, final charging order and order for sale, just simply because they've got a property asset that is spare. They don't need it to live in. It's a vehicle of wealth expansion. So we found that the court seemed to be quite happy to say, well, we're going to grant, you know, this order for sale with vacant possession. Um, but yeah, you, you convert it into a county court judgment and then all the normal suite of enforcement options are available. I see. No, that's really helpful. Um, a couple of people have commented that they didn't see um, Ben's comment on, on, the, on, on what you were saying about rent to rent. But essentially, um, Ben has said that since RVJ decision has pretty much killed off RROs for the 200 clients we see annually, um, our data reveals that less than 5% recovery rate against rent to rent companies in respect of RROs, even with chasing third-party debts or orders, 58% of cases, the immediate landlord is a limited company with no assets, as Al mentioned, and they just fold without um, them paying. Then we do come back to you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a question about um, from Sylvia about AWAB's law. Is there any reference yet as to who will be able to investigate and provide a report um, building surveyor. I mean, this is one of the issues that I think we face to do with Section 9A um, in terms of fitness for human habitation, because a lot of building surveyors don't want to comment directly on that. They say it's not in our expertise, so it can be better to have um, an environmental health consultant. It's really difficult to get one to do a report. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the sorry, sorry, yes, the proposal is that whoever, it's the landlord's obligation. So in relation to the way that this law is framed, they will have the obligation to do it. There's nothing to to stop the tenant who presumably, you know, if they come to you, if it's, 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 if it's that significant, they may well have come to you anyway. If they haven't come to you, then um, the landlord, for in all cases, the landlord has, has to do it. And the consultation um, su uh, suggests that they will have to be, whoever does it, will have to be properly um, 
they have to be experienced and have the appropriate skills. I can't remember exactly what it says now. So obviously you will want to know what their experience is and how they're appropriately skilled in this. If you are if you are in the situation you want your own you report yourself for your client, well, it is just as in the public sector where there's a lack of EHOs, there's, there's expert EHOs in the private sector, if you like, people who will do it um, uh, outside of local authorities. There's also a lack of those. And as Ed said, you know, some building surveyors won't, won't be able to comment on it. So in the end, it's a question for the court. And it may well be that you just have to put enough evidence before the court to decide whether under Section 10. But yeah, I agree, it is a problem. Um, uh, getting uh, us getting qualified people but the local uh, the land the social landlord is going to have to get them suitably qualified people to meet his duty and then i think you're actually in the process of typing an answer to ben's question but i think it's an interesting one for the group he asked what are your thoughts on the proposed decent home standard for private rented sector enforcement officers largely think it is just more unnecessary legislation when there is already adequate cover, the real problem being lack of staffing and resources. And I think it's right that Duluk are very keen on introducing decent home standards and expanding the reach of it to pri private rented sector. I don't know if you have any thoughts. I mean, it's all... Um, well, well it's, going to, it's going to be in there. Um, it's going to suffer the same problem that other areas in, uh, suffer, which is resources for the local authority to enforce. There is, they may be able to target it better because if if they're obliged to 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 test or whatever to confirm that their property meets the decent home standards, and then a, a local authority can say, "Oh, why don't we go and check that?" And then if it doesn't, then they're, they're you know that might be an offence. Or certainly breach of requirements. Um, so there may be there may be some merit in it. Having said that, the actual decent home standards, yes, the category one hazards are already covered under um, the Housing Act 2004. The repair standards, well, you know, it's got to be an old uh, part of the structure, and old can be anything up to like 40, 50 years, and it's got to need major work. So it's it's kind of it's a standard which is much higher than ordinary pair standards. Um, so I, I'm not so sure about the um, efficiency of it and how a landlord's going to know whether or not their their property meets that standard. Again, they're going to need an expert surveyor, <laughs> environmental health person to go around. All these things are connected. So um, yep. I, I don't know yeah, how it's, whether it'll be uh, effective or not. OK, that's great. So just a couple more um, and this is for Al or Tim to pitch in um, from Amita. Um, and in fact, Stefano's asked this, uh, 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 an allied question, as it were. Can a tenant apply for an RRO if the landlord has applied for a license, but the licensing application is on hold due to delays, backlogs by a local authority? And then the second RRO question is how expensive is it for a landlord to defend a claim? for an RRO. Yeah, so so take uh, I can take those in order. Um, once a landlord submitted a license application, as long as it's the right type of license application, until the local authority has either like rejected it or comes to some form of decision, they have a defense. Uh, or rather, they're not in breach of the law. So it's not uncommon. Licensing scheme comes in tenant finds out the property is not licensed, but actually the landlord applied for a license at the right time. And uh, just because of the way schemes work and how they have to be funded, it can often be about 12 to 18 months before they dealt with the backlog. Uh, the landlord hasn't committed a breach if they'd applied for a license until the local authority says, I, you know, we reject this license application. Um, and that's actually probably the most common reason that tenants are unsuccessful because they don't understand that element. In, in terms of average costs for a landlord defending a claim, um, if it doesn't go to a hearing, usually it, if they're doing a proper good, proper job, submitting the evidence, maybe eight and a half thousand pounds, nine thousand um, pounds, if and that's inclusive of VAT, I would say. And obviously, if they, they need a barrister for the day, you add that cost on as well. So you may be, depending again on the experience of the barrister, 
somewhere between 14 and 17,000. Um, and I think it's actually probably one of the reasons why there's quite a high settlement rate for rent repayment orders. Usually the rents are quite low because the properties are in really poor standard um, and the cost of defending the proceedings are quite high. That's great. Um, so just um, <clears throat> um, Sylvia's made a helpful observation. EHOs may be able to comment in regard to hazards um, but EHOs are not expert in building construction when it comes to determining the cause of the damp. A building surveyor is the most suitable person to identify the cause. And I mean, that's right. When the um, CPR came in and um, part 35, you, you, had, you had district judges saying that you had to get a surveyor to identify the, the cause of dampness. But now we've got Section 9A, where you've got to identify that it's unfit for human habitation. And there are quite a lot of surveyors who will sit on the fence and say they use expressions such as, um, you know, there may be an issue under Section 9A or Section 9A is relevant, um, whatever that means. And then finally, there, there might be, I think there might be some courses available, we might call fast track courses for surveyors, sort of, a, I think there's some maybe at Warwick University. Um, yeah. uh, to enable surveyors to double skill really quickly, which may make a, a more lucrative market for surveyors. Absolutely, I, I think I think given the changes um, uh, confronting us, yeah, it might be a very good idea. It might be a busy course. And then finally, um, there's a request for Catherine. Would it be possible to send the case law mentioned in Catherine's presentation? Well, I think I think a lot of it will come out in February's lag. Is that right? Yes, so both those cases I mentioned, the Aylesbury one and the and, and the Desita case of um, automatically 100% are both there. And I'm, I'm last year I was able to send the, just those pages to people uh, with the notes uh, of the seminar. So I'll try and do that again this year. But they are in the seminar, mentioned in the seminar at the end of the notes. That's fantastic. Well, unfortunately, um, there's no time for any more questions. We've overrun. But I think I think we'd all agree that it was well worth the extra time for such interesting and formative um, um, lectures, as it were. Um, so it just remains for me to thank our speakers. Um, you can wave your hands online or whatever. Um, and also, um, we obviously appreciate your feedback when you the Zoom ends, you'll get um, a pop up, which we are very grateful if you fill in because it helps us with um, the next seminars and our seminar program. The other thing is you will be sent a link to the recordings and the slides and Catherine will add further information. And last thing to say is um, the, the next um, seminar, there's this uh, seminar on the 22nd of February, discrimination, um, um, disability discrimination in housing, with David Renton and Rianne Davis speaking, which again ought to be a fascinating talk on the 22nd of February. Um, so thank you for attending and thank you for our speakers.